My name is Bob Bregent. Uh, this is our presentation on Splunk. Uh, I just want to answer any concerns that anybody might have in the room right now. Uh, I assure you, I don't work for Splunk. Uh, Joe here, Joe does not work for Splunk. Uh, we both are employed gainfully by the University of Illinois and are not receiving any compensation whatsoever from a vendor for this presentation. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Bob Bregent. I'm a senior IT security engineer at the University of Illinois uh, in our central IT shop. Uh, this is Joe Barnes here. Uh, he's my boss, uh, currently the interim CISO. Um, at least for a little bit longer until hopefully we can get him an official title. So talking about logging and talking about Splunk, um, some things that you need before you can have anything useful out of Splunk, of course, is you need a couple of prerequisites. You need the logging to be going somewhere where you've got access to it, somewhere central. Um, and luckily, luckily we had something, uh, we had a, situation here where we were able to already have that in place for the most part um, because, of course, you can't do anything interesting. You can't ask questions about the data that you don't have. Uh, and we, as, as you go through a Splunk deployment or any other SEM or any log management tool, you, of course, quickly realize which data you have and which data you don't have. Um, one of the nice things about a product uh, such as Splunk, uh, which we used here, uh, is that it can help us out here a little bit. Uh, these systems that have agents out that you can put on machines can help you get this data into central log stores, but of course you do run some risks with that, and uh, hopefully over the course of this presentation we'll let you know some of the things that we figured out and uh, some of the things that hopefully you can learn from this. Uh, our experience with central logging uh, is that we as, as the central IT organization, we found that we mostly had a couple of big sources. You would look at your logs and you see all sorts of things. You see thousands of devices in that log server. And realistically, there's about five things that make up 90% of that log data. Uh, we have our IDS, we had Bro. It was doing the vast majority of our log data, um, followed uh, in a distant second by the firewalls, which people used to think had a lot of information, uh, then the DNS query logs and Exchange and AD. Uh, and realistically, if you look at those numbers there, everything else, everything else, every one of those other servers, we have every switch on campus logging to this central source that we've got. Uh, we have every router, every wireless controller that we've got on campus all log in there. All of that runs about 15 gigs a day. Um, and it's one of those great things when you're talking to people on a campus about, uh, you know, about their log sources, about the log sources that you think you might need and that they might be able to provide you with, uh, they'll say, well, that's, we've, we've got a lot of data. We've got, we've got way too much data for you to be able to handle. And uh, trust me, they don't. Uh, unless they happen to be one of those top five guys, they really, they really don't. Um, and of course, on a nice central syslog server, you can do some nice things like zip things up. And uh, as a result, uh, it really only takes, it takes a tenth of the space. These are all uncompressed values that I listed up there. It only takes a tenth of that space to store the data in an archived zipped format. So now, moving on beyond just, you know, central logging, actually being able to do something with those logs. I mean, you know, because grep is great and, you know, it, it, it works. It really does. And you can do, you can do lots of stuff with grep. Uh, but it, sometimes it's nice to have something nicer on top of it. Uh, and there are other alternatives to Splunk, don't get me wrong. Uh, we went with Splunk. Uh, but we did, we did look at the other alternatives. There are open source alternatives. There's uh, Elsa. There's plenty of others, uh, and there's commercial alternatives, there's all the various SEM vendors, uh, and this is you know, nothing, nothing against them, but we went, th we went this route because we were looking for very granular access control, and we were able to, we were able to actually achieve that uh, going through Splunk, because we were able to not only create access controls based on the indexes that we were putting data into, but even within those indexes, uh, we were able to further add fine-grained access control uh, we also had the benefit of flexible field uh, definitions. Uh, so even after we put data in, uh, because we're all human, we all make mistakes, uh, some of us more than others, uh, and <laughs> after we put data in, sometimes we realize, oh, that regex that I tried to use to split out all those fields, it's not actually right. I don't catch this particular type, or I missed this field that I need. And 
it's a great advantage of a system like Splunk to be able to look at that and go, okay, well, I can just tweak the regex and it'll go back and fix it for me. Uh, also, Splunk has a very nice API, which has allowed us to do a lot of very beautiful automation stuff uh, that allows us to get the data back out of Splunk so we can use it in other systems as well, which is really a key advantage here. Um, some basic architecture, we looked at the architecture rec recommendations from uh, the Splunk documentation, and we decided, well, okay, so for indexers, we're going to need about one per 150 or 250 gigs. Uh, their recommendation's a little higher. In our experience, it seems like to maintain an acceptable level of performance, uh, we really wanted it to be a little lower, uh, so we, we're much closer to the 150 range there. Um, there are some options for how you set your search heads up. Uh, you can pool them, uh, which allows you to actually create a group, of, a high availability, or well, uh, a performance you know, cluster of search heads that people can hit in order to split their searches up across those search heads, or you can split them up into separate search heads like we've uh, actually done in our implementation, and that winds up where we have the security group that can hit its own dedicated search head. That means that when the central IT organization's running all sorts of queries, it doesn't affect the queries that the security group's running. Uh, so the security group can run things and they can run crazy stuff and not worry about affecting anybody else's performance as well. There's also the clustering question. Um, and I'm sort of going over this in the very broad strokes here. Uh, there's a lot of architecture considerations and unfortunately, uh, you know, it. it varies wide, wildly depending on your particular organization. Uh, we do, I do get into a little more detail about that in a minute though. Um, there's, also a little, there's also a few other things, and those are some things that you really can't forget. Uh, <laughs> when I was considering how to create this, I wasn't thinking about a lot of these things, and now I realize that they're very, very important. Um, there is a database monitoring system that you can use for Splunk. Uh, it's useful to have that on its own machine. There's also what I consider now one of the key pieces of our Splunk architecture, which is a syslog forwarder. Um, because when you bring data in from a Splunk agent uh, or from the database monitoring service, you wind up bringing it in to Splunk. And then, well, that's, that's great, but then you don't have access to it anywhere else. And you know, if Splunk died or you decided you didn't want to use Splunk in four years, that could become a problem. And the syslog forwarder is a nice, quick little solution to that uh, that we've worked out for our, our, our environment, and we've got some details on that in a minute here, uh, that allows you to not only send the data that you're collecting to a system like Splunk, but also to your own normal syslog system that everybody knows how to use and everybody understands. So, uh, speaking a little more about the syslog integration, uh, I, it's really, it's, it's a great uh, system because Splunk can grab all that data, but it's vendor neutral the way that you can back it up into the syslog and you can all, and it's, it's a nice disaster recovery strategy because when you're importing stuff from your syslog solution, you can always just import archived data and sure it might violate the license for a couple days as you import it all, but once you've got those couple days worth of violations in, you can go back to your normal usage and you've got all that old archive data back in there uh, and that's a great way to load stuff in at the beginning as well. Uh, it does require a heavy forwarder though. Uh, the, the universal or the light forwarder don't get it cut because they can't perform the actual syslog forwarding. Um, and there are actually configs for this uh, later on in this slide deck which should be available. Uh, so if you wanted to make one of these happen, you can do so. So talking about how to extract data, uh, there's some very small data, the very small text there, don't worry about that too much. Uh, it's, mostly meant for examples. Uh, so the extraction of data out of the Splunk system is done at search time, and that differs very much from some of the other systems that we looked at when we were looking at alternatives here, because the search time extraction means that if you wanna change a field definition, if you want to add a new field definition, you can do that whenever you want, and it's actually retroactive into the data that's already been indexed. Most places are doing index time extraction, which means that once, once you put that in there, once you put in your field extraction, and then you try to bring the data in, if it wasn't extracted right at index time, that's not searchable in a useful way anymore for you. Uh, this search time extraction allows you to completely ignore that, allows you to just throw data at the system and then go back and say, oh, this is what I needed. 
And that's really quite, we found that very useful. Like I said, we're all human. We all make mistakes sometimes. We all find new things that we need to do sometimes. And that's how we do that. Uh, it also supports aliasing, which is great because it means that your central organization, uh, the, your administrator of the Splunk system can try to go through and say, I think that this should be named this. I think that this should be named this. And Splunk actually has some uh, rules for telling you how, how you should be naming stuff so that various add-ons can pull things in and know what things will be named. But some users might not like that. They might think, oh, well, this is, I, I, I see why you named this field this name, but I think it should be called this. It works better for me if it's called this. I'll understand it better. And it's okay because there's aliases for that, so they don't have to petition you to change it. You can have a field that's named you know, Mac, Source Mac, uh, User Mac, all those things. It can have all those names all at the same time, not a problem. Uh, the one thing that you do have to know when you're extracting data out of a Splunk system, though, is you get really good at Perl compatible regular expressions. Uh, and I apologize if that scares anyone. Uh, <laughs> I, I promise, though, it's not that bad. I didn't know anything about them when I started, and uh, you know, I can I can now write things like are on that on the bottom of that slide where it's tons of parentheses, tons of various very scary looking. Uh, regular expression syntax, but it's not that bad. Splunk has great documentation about it. You can learn it. Your, and for those of you who are in administration, your IT staff can learn about it. Trust me, it's not that bad. Um, talking a little more about how, what you get when you extract your data, uh, there's another feature of extracting the data out of the Splunk system that we've found is great. Uh, we use it a lot. Uh, and it solves one of the problems that we were having with our previous syslog-based solution, where we can actually do computed fields and we can change, we can modify the fields, uh, the extracted field result, without actually changing any of the data. So we have, using the example here, we have various systems that log Macs in every format under the sun. We have a radius server that logs max two characters uppercase separated by dashes. We have a DHCP server that's all characters lowercase separated by colons. And then we have, we have a, uh, what's the other one? Uh, we have another server, I promise, uh, that's four characters all lowercase separated by periods. And it can be terrible when you're trying to grep through that system. If you're trying to go from one log to another, you can't just you know, pipe things to each other because the format's got to change. And you've got to remember which format you're using it in every one. A, sim a system like this, when you put something like this into Splunk, it tells it to pull out all those, uh, pull out all those punctuation characters, split things into groups of two, put colons between them, and make them all lowercase. So then when you put something in and you say, I I want you to use the values that you got out of this radius server's logs and search for the DHCP logs that match those. It says, great, I took the radius server logs and I performed this on it. I already normalized it. It's already in the format that the other one's going to be in, and then it can, it can search those other logs. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this screenshot might be a little small for some of you. Um, but what we've got here is we've got a search for a source Mac. And it's saying this source Mac is DE colon AD colon BE colon EF colon 1, 2 colon 3, 4. And we print those out in a table. And you can see that what it returns is actually our DHCP server, which has its stuff in that format. It returns stuff from the radius server, which was using the uppercase format. And it's OK. They're all on that same. They all came back as a result of that search, even though they're in random different formats. Um, a quick note about searching data. If you're trying to do correlation, uh, map looks like what you want. I promise you it's not. Uh, it's terrible for performance. Uh, but it, I mean, it does work, but it's, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is subsearch. Uh, subsearch, if you're trying to correlate data with Splunk, the thing that we've learned in doing this and in doing our work with Splunk over, these, over this past year or so? Year and a half. Year and a half uh, <laughs> is that you, if, if you do something like this, uh, where you do index equals wireless, for example, that's where we've got our wireless logs, and you do, some, and you do a, another search inside these brackets that returns a list of Macs, you can tell, that will tell it, oh, I, you wanted to search the wireless index for the list of Macs that that search returned, and then you can do other stuff with it. You can do some really cool stuff with that. For example, here's an, here's an actual search. Uh, we did this search uh, and put this on a neat little dashboard for people. This is uh, what percentage of our users log into the VPN with two-factor auth. 
Um, so first we filtered it to the in VPN index, only looked at successful logins. Then we did a quick statistics uh, function on that and told it to count the number of field, the number of lines that it returned and make that the total and count the number that hit the duo server. That's not the real duo server IP, obviously, uh, and label that duo. And then just calculate the percentage there and make a nice little table. And what you get out of that is you get a pretty, you can make a pretty little dashboard right like that. And every time somebody refreshes the page or on a schedule that you so choose, they can see this nice, pretty dashboard of the amount of people that are using it with two factor. It's not particularly useful for most things. It might be nice to show your C level folks, but it, it's an example of the kinds of things you can do. You can do that kind of quick math and you can make it show up out of those logs on, in real time. Uh, a slightly more useful search, perhaps, uh, some simplified copyright attribution. And this actually uses the correlation that we talked about earlier. Um, would be to search the firewall logs for our natted vert for the external IP version that got reported to us and the external source port, um, and then do and then pull out the internal IP, and then run that through our DHCP log to pull the MAC address, and then run that through our radius and our Quick Connect, which is one of our wireless systems logs, to pull the user. So now we've just we've gone from an external IP to an internal IP to a MAC to a user. And that's all in one search. So you didn't, you didn't have to run four searches to pull each individual step. You can actually just chain all that stuff together, use the correlation, and you can p get Splunk to pull together the data from all of these different data sources that might have previously been you know, a flat file here, a database here, and you can pull them all together and tell it, just do all of this for me. And you can put that again onto a nice dashboard. Uh, and again, all of those numbers are fake, but the dashboard does work and do what it should do, and you can put in a timestamp, you put in a source port, put in an IP, tell it to submit, and it just shoots back a user. Um, realistically, copyright work uh, with our real log data set uh, takes probably 10 or 15 minutes per ticket. Um, with this search, it takes about 20 to 30 seconds per ticket. Um, that's a pretty good, time savings right there for us. Um, as previously mentioned, we had some, we had some uh, authorization issues with some previous solutions. And so when we went looking for a solution here, uh, moving on from all the searching and all of that, looking at more of the administration here, uh, when we went looking for a solution like Splunk, we wanted to make sure that we had really fine-grained authorization so that we could not only say, you know, the security office has full access to everything. The Splunk administrator fine has full access to everything. Um, we could say the help desk. The help desk needs access to some of this data. We don't want to give them access to the actual underlying data set. That would be way too much information for them. But we do want them to have some of this. For example, here, we have that they get access to event ID 644 and event ID 4740. Um, and if there's an AD person in the room, they might be able to tell you that those are Windows event codes for account lockouts. Um, and so we gave the help desk access only to the Active Directory indexes, and even further, we filtered it so that they only had access to those specific event IDs, so that when they searched for this user in the AD logs, what they saw were account lockouts, so they could quickly find out when they were locked out and where from. Uh, additionally, in, on the subject of authorization, you can do summary indexing, uh, which is a great, it's a neat little trick uh, that they've got that allows you to take your data and pull out some information about it so that then you can provide that information, that summary data. You can say, you know, let's say we've got the firewall log. You can take that firewall log data and say, I want to pull the number of connections per hour out into a separate table. And then you can give your C-level people or just your general campus people, or you could pump this to an API account that's displaying this on a web page. You could say, this account has access to this summary data about the number of flows per hour. But even no matter what goes wrong, when you're looking, you know, when, when, when that user tries to poke around or whatever, they cannot ever get to the underlying real, here's all the flows for campus data 
Or for example, if you wanted to provide, uh, say, a C-level person with access to how many devices does each user on campus have? Uh, how many, how many you, distinct MAC addresses are we seeing per distinct user account? You could do that, and you could use summary indexing even to do that without giving them access to, here's the list of all the MAC addresses and all the users that we've seen on the network, which is really quite nice, trust me. Um, you can also use Apple, uh, Splunk apps to provide some degree of separation by granting specific user roles permission on certain apps. Uh, that can provide you with a little bit of additional permission functionality that we often did not see in the other solutions that we certainly didn't have before when we were trying to manage um, the access to people's flat file logs, quite frankly. So talking a little bit about bringing in new data, some other challenges that you might encounter with a Splunk system or well, with any central logging system. Um, when you're bringing in new data, you can bring it into central, to a central log storage, um, and it might not be terribly, it might not be terribly efficient, it might not be easy to manage, um, you know, you, because you're going to have people who are running a server and you're going to try to tell them, here, uh, you know, run, run a syslog client on this Windows server and syslog it to me, and they're going to go, no, that, that's, I don't know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> but with a Splunk agent uh, or the Splunk database collector, you can actually pull in some of that data in a much easier format. Uh, because you have central administration of those systems, you can, for example, give someone the Splunk Windows agent and say, here you go, you know, install this on the machine, and I've told it where to go ahead and look for the IS logs, I've told it where to pull the event logs out of, and so it, it'll just know, and if we need to update stuff on our end, we can go ahead and do that manually, and you won't have to touch it, you just have to keep this updated. Um, it can be a little dangerous uh, because people do worry a little bit about uh, what permissions you've got on their systems, but ultimately they can lock things down and they can run it themselves if they want to. Um, it can also be a little dangerous because if you're running all of this Splunk stuff, like I said, it, it's gonna log it into Splunk. And so unless you're using something like Splunk to syslog, you know, to, using a Splunk forwarder to a syslog system to keep a separate record of that data, you can wind up with your data in one data store that you might not always have access to. Uh, so that's another consideration when you're using those, those type of systems. Um, this is sort of a wrap up for my portion, then we'll get on to Joe. Uh, the sort of my big picture lessons learned that we've, that I've found in the last year or so of running the system uh, is that you really have, do have to have a plan for the fields. Uh, the Splunk common information model is very nice and a lot of the apps expect your fields to be pulled out in that format. So if your fields are pulled out in whatever format you've got, you know, you decided this is going to be uh, Illinois user, and this is going to be a device MAC address. It can get a little tough when you're trying to integrate with vendor apps or when you're trying to just pull down the neatest, the neat late, latest thing that uh, someone has published to Splunk and you find it doesn't work with any of your stuff because, oh, it's expecting your data to be in a format that it's totally not in. Um, the other thing is to plan to put your fields into apps. Uh, you know, we took, you typically think of apps as something that you pull down from a central store, and you can do that. You can totally do that. Um, but also, apps within the Splunk infrastructure tend to be something called, uh, they tend to be just basically groups of configuration files on the deployment server. Um, and so when you're breaking your fields up, when you're doing your field extractions, when you're bringing in your data sources, you will want to make sure to use those apps to manage your data because when you've got all of your data, when you've got all of your configurations in one single giant configuration file for every data source you've got, every field extraction, every one of those regexes for every different type of event you could imagine is all in one giant config file, it can be a real pain to manage. It's really much cleaner, it's much simpler, and it's much easier to push things out and to manage what's going to which systems if you've broken them into separate apps. Um, also, uh, minor, problem that we ran into is that private IP space, it turns out, not your friend with this system, um, unless you have some sort of proxy, because a lot of the Splunk apps try to go out and pull in information to provide a more rich user experience. They want to pull in Google Maps. They want to pull in the Mac OUI database from the internet, and it gets a little tricky when you can't actually get to the internet from your Splunk system, 
uh, it, you can do it. It's not, it's not impossible, but it does make the deployment that much harder. Uh, like I mentioned, the deployment server is a wonderful thing. Um, the deployment server is actually a way, and I don't think I mentioned it earlier, uh, it's a way that you can manage your Splunk configuration files from a central system and push them out uh, in a puppet style way. Um, though there is a GUI and there is a nice, very, very user-friendly GUI available on pretty much all the systems, if you, you, if you wind up using that for anything major, uh, for a major deployment, it can very quickly become a bear to manage. Um, trying to manage your field extractions on three or four different indexers, or trying to manage shared searches and shared dashboards on three or four different search heads, when you have to go into the web UI and make each change by hand every time, is quickly quickly unbearable. Uh, even if you start with one server, trust me, it's it's better to start with the deployment server. Uh, and at that point, you do wind up making changes to text configuration files, but it's ultimately it's a lot easier to manage. Um, as mentioned earlier, there are lots of shiny new apps, and your users will want them. Um, they will want the apps because they will see that their data is useful, and they might not always have time to write all the field extractions or ask you to write all the field extractions or ask you to help them with their searches. And people have written these searches and have written the field extractions for them. They will want those. They will want to use the applications that enrich their data, that enrich their searches. And they really will want to use the system. Uh, that was one thing that I was really shocked by, is that <laughs> this is apparently quite popular. Uh, when, we, when we stood this up, we really stood it up for the security group and were hoping that other people would be interested and it, it worked out far beyond my greatest expectations. So, uh, Speaking of how, you know, getting more into the administration side, uh, we've got Joe here. Joe was the interim CISO and he's handled a lot of the administration functions for us and I'll let him take over for the remainder here. Thanks, Bob. So what Bob covered in about 25 minutes, just from a, a time frame, well, that was about uh, three years ago, Bob and I started a conversation to how do we replace, replace our somewhat existing commercial logging system with something that would scale for the University of Illinois, and, um, and particularly for the security office, but beyond. So, so what he covered in 25 minutes uh, took about two years to get there. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about selling a dream. Um, this is, uh, this is, this applies, this is generic, this goes beyond Splunk, this could be for any other logging solution, this could be for whatever else you need you are, but uh, a lot of this is common sense, but as Bob and I were doing this uh, for the last few years and we've sort of gone through some of the technical troubles, gone through some procurement issues, gone through some political issues, um, gone through all sorts of other issues that if I had another hour and a half or maybe a few drinks we could talk about later, but um, we kept talking to other schools and other groups and realized that they were learning from what we were doing. So the real point of today was to get this message out so that if you are trying to deploy a system or thinking about it or, or, or in between, that, that you can stand on our shoulders and sort of take some of that time frame out of it and perhaps uh, take advantage of some of the things that we did well or um, learn from some of the things we didn't do so well. So uh, here's the disclaimer. Um, this is just uh, the following statement applies to Splunk as our logging front end after exploring and building a central logging environment in a heterogeneous decentralized environment like the University of Illinois. Splunk was selected by Illinois to meet our needs with respect to creating a scalable, manageable, and easily distributable platform that could be used to combine, correlate, and share data with functional groups that can be effectively make decisions to their appropriate area. Regardless of the tool or your solution you're currently using and trying to expand or piloting, the remaining advice should be a good guide for you. All right, now that I got the legal mumble jumble out of the way, um, here's what I've learned uh, with about the last, uh, we, had a, we had a logging environment as Bob talked about. We back ended with an RSS log environment. We had a commercial solution beforehand. We weren't happy with the commercial solution. It did not work for a higher ed environment. It, was, it, it just did not work by many means. We were, we were spending too much money on the maintenance and solutions, so we said, let's change this. So we stood up this, this syslog environment, and it was working all right, and we were starting to collect logs, and then we're like, crap, we can't really search this effectively. We would do searches for, for example, um, our exchange group wanted to send out a mass communication, target it to individuals who were using a particular um, URL. They were about to make the change to this URL, and instead of blasting a message out to everyone, they said, hey, wouldn't it be nice to communicate with our customers who are just using this service and have them change the URL? So in our old environment, the syslog environment, we, we spent a few minutes, probably 10, 15 minutes, Bob came up with, uh, with the query to search for, and then he grabbed through our logs. 24 hours later, we came back, 
And as long as he wrote his script properly, it came back with the results that we could give to the exchange group. Fast forward to Splunk, same process, took about three seconds. Um, so that was one of the things. What we've learned through this is, is to know your audience. You know, we knew as a security group that we could use this tool, we could get intelligence, and that excited everybody in the security group. And what we found out was nobody else really cared. Um, same thing from an IT operational perspective. I went and talked to webmasters. I went and talked to people running our, our um, spam filters, running our exchange environment, running our LMS systems, telling them that you could use this tool from a correlation standpoint and answer some of your questions. They were very excited, but everyone else still didn't care. Um, the same thing on a business intelligence standpoint. I was talking to our accountants, to our um, money crunchers, everyone saying, you know, are we spending our IT dollar effectively? And I said, well, if you look at the utilization on these systems, you can see how you're allocating resources and maybe you can better determine how you're spending your money. They were excited. Again, nobody cared. Nobody else really cared. Um, talked to a bunch of researchers. I had so many coffee meetings with researchers on campus talking about how they could take their data and put it into something like Splunk and answer some of their questions instead of spending a ton of time paying a developer or some other resources to come up with a tool that could crunch and do correlation. They were also very excited, but again, it was meaningless to others. And then even from a public safety standpoint, if I could tell you that Splunk helped save lives, people cared, but not everybody. So what's the point? These are all valid uses of Splunk. Actually, each one of those were stories that I've told, and some of them are, are real world examples that I'll get to. But the point was, each time I had a conversation with an individual, if they were the CIO, or if they were the chancellor, or if it was a researcher, or if it was just somebody on the street who wanted to know more about IT or just business operations, you had to know what excited them. You had to put yourself in their shoes, and then you had to be able to tell and sell that story to them so that they were interested. And uh, not only did you have to tell them that story, and it had to be short and to the point, but you often had to repeat that story. I'd have the same conversations over and over again with individuals just to reinforce the point. Another thing that I learned was there was no single selling point. You know, we had all these different scenarios. If I told you that um, there was a, uh, an individual who came to our campus and uh, he drove across country to find his girlfriend and um, he unfortunately took a knife and, and stabbed her and, um, and then was being looked for the police. She passed away and, and then the, the police said, where is this individual at? And they came to us and said, do you have any location information on the individual? And we said, maybe. And it turns out he was checking his email from a hotel room in Urbana. And about uh, 20 minutes later, we had some of that uh, IP information that we could give to the police that they could then correlate with the ISP that did internet service for a hotel. It took 20 minutes because it was over the lunch period of, um, and 19 minutes, it took us about 19 minutes to find the exchange administrator to get a, our hands on some extra logs and about a minute to actually find some correlation of data. Now I had that selling point pretty early on in the story that we helped take somebody off the street who was, you know, harm, could cause harm to the university. Um, but when I sold that story to an accountant trying to get funding for Splunk and for a body to ma manage this, she didn't care. She didn't seem to understand. She, maybe she cared. I, I don't know. I can't make the judgment. But she didn't, it, didn't, it didn't jive with her. And then finally when I said, look, we have this data warehouse. We have all this information that's, that's shoveled into this data warehouse, and we pay people to write reports off of this data warehouse. What would it be like if we didn't have people to actually write those reports? She was like, well, the data would be pretty much worthless. I said, that's the same thing with this tool here. So she instantly got it, and she was on board. So what's the point? You need to know your audience. You need to determine your needs. It, regardless if we're talking about Splunk or we're talking about some other tool, if you understand what these people's needs are, and if you can address those needs with your tool, come up with some sort of story to sell it to them, this is going to go a long way. Again, you're going to have to repeat yourself over and over again, but um, it helps. So think about how you would make people's lives easier. Um, are we missing some metrics? You know, Bob was pointing to the C-level suite. They're always looking for pretty pictures and charts and metrics. It's always, a, we need metrics for this. Well, this tool provided some metrics pretty quickly and uh, was a quick win for IT operations. Um, we had some quick wins with our networking group. There were some efforts uh, to reduce uh, remedial tasks, some scripts that, that had been written years ago that were somewhat maintained and weren't. Put them into Splunk, and now Splunk ran this on an automated schedule and provided that information back to the people who needed to have that information. Um, we're providing clarity for complex questions. This is actually one of my best uh, stories. We have uh, uh, an LMS, and one of the biggest complaints from the people supporting our LMS from the actual um, administrators is a student will complain that they've submitted their homework, and mysteriously, the digital electronic dog ate their homework, and it's nowhere to be found for the faculty member. So they would spend you know, minutes to half a day searching for, depending on the time of year, 
looking to see if these students actually submitted this information and if there was you know, something wrong with the system or if the students actually didn't turn their homework in. Splunk can solve that problem for them instantly. Now, we haven't got that working into place yet, but you should see their eyes light up when we explain that, that solution to them. That They said to me, wait, you don't have to cross over to three different servers and look into two different databases and, and this flat file? And I said, yes, yeah, Splunk will do that for you. Um, and then you can also use it to justify funding needs. We are in the middle of going through a wireless expansion project, and we helped use Splunk to determine some of those metrics to, to push some of those funding needs. So it's success stories, you've got to have them. You've got to have a lot of them. You've got to, they've got to be short, they've got to be to the point, they've got to pull to the heartstrings. Um, if you don't have them, ask around, you can find some more. I have other examples from other institutions where um, pre-Splunk, they had a, a death threat come in, took 24 hours to, to figure out if that threat was legitimate or not. Turns out it wasn't legitimate. Post-Splunk, they had a, a bomb threat or a, no, it was a suicide um, a threat come in took them a few minutes to get that information. They actually go check, did a health and wellness check on that individual. It turns out that individual was a danger to herself and they were able to, to save her life and get her the treatment she needed. Um, so always be on the lookout for, know, for more, know them by heart, keep it meaningful and simple. Um, tell everyone, tell everyone who will listen. Tell them over and over again. I was in meetings with various individuals. I would tell them, this is what Splunk can do, this is what central law you can do. And if, if you think you've told them, tell them again. If they're not listening, make them listen, tell them again. And you'll know you're starting to be successful when you're actually sitting in meetings and other people are sitting there saying, well, Splunk can do that, right? And, uh, and then there's this little worry in your mind that, that Splunk can do everything. That's what these meetings turned into. It's like, oh, Splunk can do this. And it was the joke was, well, yeah, it can even make toast for you. And I was like, okay, not yet. So you're trying to manage some expectations. But um, if you keep going at it, you can. Um, the one thing I'd like to say is, you know, Bob's, we spent two years talking about it from a technical standpoint. I'll try to add a, leave a few minutes for questions, but um, the actual selling of a dream in terms of timeline was about a year, a year and a half process as well. So we started three years ago. The technology came pretty easily. Um, you know, we sort of said we wanted to do something that would help security, but from a bigger picture, more of a, a correlation of data, take it outside of IT, take it into the enterprise and try to sell it that way. And, and as Bob said, the technology came along. We stood up what we needed. Bob made a ton of friends, probably too many friends than he can count now. Um, and then when it came to let's fund it and let's put it into place, it was about another year and a half effort in parallel. Um, so that's Splunk, that's the University of Illinois. Um, we've got some questions. I know that these slides are available online and there, Bob had referenced them. If you, there's a, some appendix in the back of the slides that will actually give you some more examples. Um, the one other comment is if your questions aren't answered today or you want to talk about this in general, our contact information is available. We're more than well willing to talk about this and how this works in your environments. Again, not necessarily to spell, sell Splunk, but just, uh, you know, if, if you have these concerns or questions, odds are we've addressed them in some way, shape, or form or, or have some insight that we're willing to share. So with that, the clock says I have two minutes left. If there's any questions, we'll take questions. And if not, we'll give you two minutes of your life back. How many zeros in Splunk cost? We, uh, part of the problem, part of the challenge um, being from the University of Illinois and um, its procurement cycles, and I won't get into that with the, politi the politics, but we were, we were able to take advantage when we were looking for a front end for our logging environment. The stars sort of aligned in Internet 2 and uh, started to use Splunk as a Net Plus service. And so we actually got in as, as in the service validation phase and sponsored this. So we ran through all that. We actually had a demo of Splunk going in a large environment for a while, and then I couldn't get our procurement uh, rules to uh, get the purchase in time. I was hoping today to be able to make the announcement that the contract was signed. It still looks like I'm waiting for one more signature. But um, we, uh, there are, it, it's an annual six-figure number, but we are, we are buying the terabyte ter tier, reselling some of it um, to our other institutions within the University of Illinois. But it's well worth it compared to our commercial product. Bob and I were talking about this at lunch. Our commercial product, the maintenance alone was about $50,000 a year. If you look at it, we're going to spend $100,000 a year on the Splunk license. And the amount of throughput and information we get is, is light years beyond what we were getting from a tool that was basically just causing us pain. So, yeah. Using it in a non vestive manner for day to day dashboards and, and operational metrics, to what extent have you been able to adapt it to that use case? So, one of the biggest wins probably. Um, I'm sorry. The question is, is how, besides, besides using Splunk from an investigation standpoint, how other ways have we used it from a day-to-day -day metrics and operations standpoint? Do you want to answer that, Bob? Sure. Um, so we have 
so of course, you know, being in the security office, our use cases are a lot of investigation and that sort of thing. But we have had great success in pushing it out to the other groups. Specifically, our networking group has rather enjoyed having Splunk. Um, they historically had been the group that had, you know, some programmer back 10 years ago wrote an application that you know, correlated these two things and produced a couple graphs, um, you know, that produced a couple graphs for, you know, how much data was going through the network or how many devices were on the network. And over time that breaks or that doesn't keep up with, you know, how things are moving and you notice some of the data on this chart's two years old now and it's not getting updated at all. Um, and so when we're able to show them Splunk and we're able to put that data into Splunk and have them you know, regenerate those queries in a, in the same way, and they're able to say, oh, well, now that now that's being updated, and it doesn't rely on you know this, these other you know three things to stay up that no one really quite knew how they worked. Uh, you know, it's all going through the same central system that everything else goes through, and it generates you know log it generates these graphs and generates these metrics in the same manner that everyone else's metrics are being generated. You have. We've we've got we've had quite a lot of success with that, and it's got sort of a, a little bit more guaranteed reliability there because it's using because it's using a central resource like that instead of these one-off systems. Um, people are much more confident that that'll stay up and that'll stay up to date. And if it breaks, there will be resources to fix it. Um, little little follow-up also uh, alerting as well because that would be something from a security office perspective you might want to know more about. So finding those times that you should have been paying attention. Yeah. Um, so we've had, um, when we've been doing the alerting, uh, we typically, uh, right now our alerting situation tends to be sending things to our security email, which generates a ticket, which then we go investigate. Um, so we do our alerting. We don't do any real-time alerting because obviously the difference between, you know, the couple seconds that, you know, there's going to be different, you know, a couple minutes actually difference between when a real-time alert would get fired off and when a scheduled search would run to, you know, if we schedule the search to run every five minutes or so, that's well within the variance of our reaction time to the email. So we just go ahead and run scheduled searches. They're a little lighter on the, in, on the uh, processor, you know, and the resource utilization on the system. Uh, but we've had fairly good success with that, uh, trying to run those uh, when we find something that we know that we need to be alerted about. Uh, so when we had, for example, when we had Heartbleed, actually, uh, we had the bro, we had bro doing some detection for the Heartbleed stuff, uh, but we weren't, it, it didn't have all of the data that we wanted, and so we were doing a Splunk search on the Heartbleed results that we were pumping in from bro, the notices that we were pumping in from bro, and then when it matched that particular search, we were having that kick off then to our ticketing system to say, oh, you know, because Bro was firing off an alert every time there was a heart bleed attempt, and we didn't really care that much about that. Uh, so we had not, so we cross-referenced that with a couple things, and then we had it send off a ticket to us that was, oh, this this was actually potentially something that we might be interested in, and I don't think we actually ever had anything that wound up being legitimate, but it was nice to have that additional filtering there when, we, when you add the extra data. I think the one piece of information I'd leave you with, since we're out of time, but it doesn't look like anybody's knocking down the door to come in. Um, when we were looking at these tools and when we were looking before we even had selected Splunk, the, the real success that we had is we sold this as it wasn't a security decision, it wasn't a security tool. It was, a, it was an operational IT tool that could be used within IT and it was a business driven tool and also a research tool. So we tried to highlight all of that to get people involved with that process. So it, really was less saying, well, security's doing this or security needs to do this, and it turned into we need to do this as an organization. So, and With that, I think we're probably out of time, so Bob and I are, I'm sure are available afterwards if there's any follow-up questions, but thank you.